Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're listening. This is Davisville on KDRT-LP, 95.7 FM in Davis, California. We live at KDRT.org online. I'm Bill Buchanan, and I thank you for tuning in. Our subject today is Link 21. This is a big story, but it's easy to overlook here in Davis. At its heart, Link 21 is a transportation project that would create a second rail link across the San Francisco Bay near the one used now by the electric trains of BART near the Bay Bridge. The bridge is 70 miles from Davis, so it's easy to think, well, it doesn't really affect us all that much, but it would, and we'll learn more about that today. My guest today is Camille Tsao. She is the Capital Corridor Project Manager for Link 21. And Camille, thank you for taking time to talk with us today. Thank you for having me, Bill. So let's, uh, well, briefly, what is Link 21 and, and why would it matter to Davis? Fundamentally, this is a project that reduces the distance between Sacramento and San Francisco, at least measured by time, right? So what's the project? How does that affect us? Well, the project is a mega regional, transformational, multi-generational project to improve passenger rail in Northern California. I know that sounds like a lot, <laughs> um, but that is our vision. That is our mission. The way it affects Davis is, well, Davis has already got a train station. You already have riders. You already have a, a culture of using the train. And imagine if train riding were faster, more frequent, how many more trips could be made by train to and from Davis? And because it is a mega regional attractor, having the university, Davis, unlike a lot of places, is both a generator and an attractor of trips. So many, many more people around the mega region could be using the train to get to and from Davis. The capital corridor service that exists in Davis right now has about, in normal times, it runs about 30 mm -hmm. trains a day and mm -hmm. has about 370,000 uh, riders use the Davis station, I think in 2019. So this would increase that number then. Yes, absolutely. Right now, Davis is our second busiest station on the Capital Corridor system. So we love our riders. Thank you for riding. And if you haven't tried it yet, you definitely should. It's a great way to get to and from Davis. But yes, what we're looking at, the reason why we want to transform the passenger rail experience is because we want more people to ride the train. We want them to see it as a viable option when they're going to and from places. So absolutely, we want to grow ridership on the train network. And you use the phrase mega region, which people mm -hmm. use from time to time. And this is the idea that the Sacramento area, up to Yuba County, to the Bay Area, all the way down to Monterey County, uh, really can be maybe ought to be thought of as one big region that's interconnected. And that uh, I guess you'd say that interconnection is sort of organic. People are doing it already on their own. And as a result, you need a transportation system that, that carries that together. Tell me a little bit more about how the service would change. Is it electric? Is it 24 hours a day? Is it more frequency? Hopefully all of the above. <laughs> okay. uh, first off, you're, you know, you're absolutely right about how you describe the mega region. Uh, it's 21 counties, uh, including all those areas that you mentioned in, in northern San Joaquin Valley as well. But yes, it, it is, it has become organic in a way. I mean, as our regions develop and grow in both population and jobs, you know, there's less space between our separate regions, right? And that's how we've become one mega region. In fact, we're the fifth largest mega region in the United States. So just, you know, economically, we're all connected whether we realize it or not. And so, and to maintain our competitiveness, we absolutely need a transportation system that serves people and moves goods efficiently too. So why is rail the solution um, as opposed to something else? You know, I don't know, telecommuting even with, with the pandemic has sort of shuffled things. Why? Why? Because this will be, um, this project will cost billions of dollars, right? And take yes. decades to build. Yes. Why put that effort into rail? Well, um, I don't think rail is the only solution. I think we, as a, as a transportation planner, I definitely believe in a multi, what I call multimodal approach. So, you know, in some cases, 
cars are more efficient, but if everybody drives a car, uh, it results in tremendous amount of congestion. A train, we can carry a lot of people, you know, 600 to 1,000 people, depending on the train set, for a fraction of the space that would be taken up by cars. But we need a, a transportation that has all, all forms of transportation. And, and we also have a ferry system here, which I think, you know, not, not many places can take advantage of a ferry system. So we need, to, we need to have it all. And it's good to have options, as we saw, you know, in cases like the Loma Prieta earthquake. So. Right, because when that earthquake hit, uh, the roads were not usable for a while. The roads um, were not usable, the freeways went down, yeah. Of course, one thing that this does is it, it supports growth. Uh, I'm sure you must know Davis is a town that is often turned away growth. It says, like other parts of the Bay Area, the mega region, it says, no thanks, mm -hmm. we don't really want that here. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this affect your planning for the project? And I don't mean just in the technical sense, but there's a concept behind this that basically says, we're gonna grow for places that don't really want to. How do you sell this project to them? That's a really good question. And I think we, we continually grapple with how to manage growth. That's really, you know, how, how land is developed, how densely it is developed, that, that is under the jurisdiction of, of the cities. So, you know, that's, that's not our place to say. I think what I will say is that, you know, how we grow we can, we can grow in different ways. If we grow around, uh, let's say, you know, transit and train stations versus spreading out, being only really accessible by automobile, you know, you get, a, you get a different kind of place. And so not every city is going to approach growth the same way. And we're not interested in forcing anyone to do uh, grow the way they don't want to grow, but for those cities that want to partner with us, certainly the cities that, you know, already have stations, we're already working with them and have a relationship with them. We, we want to, we want to work in partnership. I imagine part of your uh, approach with the project must be, there'll be a lot of discussions you'll be having with different cities and communities and civic groups and whatnot uh, along the line. Have you begun to do that yet or is that still more in the future? We're really just starting. Over the last year, we formed these working groups, which were more on the technical side, trying to anticipate uh, questions that we might get. And we have started working with a small group of jurisdictions and that group will continue to grow. But overall, this, uh, this spring, we're launching virtual open houses. We're starting to get the word out. We've launched our website, link21program.org, which anyone can visit to learn more about it. But yes, we will be going to different cities, communities, and we're really interested in hearing people's thoughts on the program. One of the things I noticed in the description of it is um, uh, there's quite a lot of discussion about the importance of what's called the one seat ride. And this is the idea, anyone familiar with the Bay Area topography or geography will know, you know, if you're in Palo Alto and you wanna to come to Davis by public transit, well, you've got a bridge to cross or you can go around the south part of the Bay, I suppose. But the point is you're gonna to have to change services. And part of the idea here is like this new crossing would be used by the Capitol Corridor. And if I understand correctly, the idea is someone could get on board in Santa Cruz and go to Rockland or Davis or, and it would be one, they wouldn't have to get off the train. Is, is this part of the vision? And, and if so, why, why is that important? It's the one seat ride idea. A one seat ride is part of the vision, however, as we develop the service plan, there's gonna be a combination of services. So in some, sometimes there will be one seat rides and other times there might be a transfer. But I think the concept of the one seat ride, really what we're saying is convenience. So for anyone who's ridden the train and had to transfer, 
if you have to wait two minutes or let's say, let's say you have to wait less than 30 seconds because you just cross the platform and get onto your next train. That is a very different feeling from having to wait 10, 20, 30 minutes. So the concept one seat ride literally, yes, does mean you would get on and not have to get off again until you got to your destination station. But I think what we're really trying to do here is make it more convenient. So if there are transfers, that those would be much easier, much better timed than they currently are. And the state, in fact, is updating its state rail plan, which looks at a what they call a pulse schedule throughout the state. And that means trains would arrive at regularly scheduled intervals timed so that transfers would be easy at stations where multiple trains meet. So the whole concept is really around passenger convenience and ease and uh, encouraging people to use the train system as a result. So more coordinated, uh, I get a sense, uh, you know, easier to use that way. More coordinated, but you know, another thing that we're looking at too, especially for Capital Corridor is travel time and reliability. Because if people are going to choose between, let's say, an automobile or a train, the first question they're going to ask is, how long is that going to take? Yeah, it's and about two, if, two hours right now from Davis to downtown yeah. San Francisco, counting the, yeah. the bus transfer. And I, I would imagine right. you, you'd want that to be a good deal faster than when this was built out. We, we, we would. And we're looking at what that would take. Is it, it's going to take more than a a crossing to reduce that travel time. So we're looking at what are the other key improvements that would be needed in order to really improve that travel time. We are talking with Camille Tsao. She is the Capital Corridor Project Manager for Link 21. This is the project to build a second rail crossing in the Bay Area. And really the larger idea is to help unite what's called the Sacramento Bay Area mega region so that transportation just flows more easily as the area grows. So how would this second crossing work? You know, anybody who's ridden BART, you know, you get on a train, you go into that tunnel, you feel the air pressure in your ears, perhaps you get off and you go on your way. Is this something similar or, or what? Um, are you asking the crossing itself? I guess what, what would that be like? Would that be like the BART tube or would it be, something new or is it too soon to say maybe <laughs> it might be too too soon to say but i think it would be it would be similar for it to be cost effective we need to be able to move a lot of trains and people through that crossing so in that sense in the terms of you know the number of trains that would be going through the capacity i mean we would like it to be on the higher end to make the project worth building um, there's a lot of things, though, that we haven't worked out. We're really at the beginning stages. People ask, you know, how many tracks do you need to go through? If you need BART tracks, if you need regional rail tracks, because they are different. Um, are you going to accommodate that? We're, we're still working that out. I think what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to be open to different possibilities, different solutions, because what we want to focus on is, are we achieving our objectives of really preparing the passenger rail network for future growth? And what is limiting us today? What is preventing us from doing that? And having that second crossing would certainly help us. The, the, even the state identified this as a critical link in the Northern California passenger rail network, but we need to study it more. Uh, which is why it's taking a few years for us to even come up with some program alternatives because we're really trying to be thorough and make sure that we're addressing the issues that need to be addressed. One of the advantages, I suppose, about talking about all this right now is that it's still being formed. So there's still a chance for mm -hmm. communities, whatever, people who are interested to weigh in on it if they want to. Right. One last question about that. I mean, would is this something where like BART and the corridor would still exist side by side? Or does this ultimately maybe replace BART? 
Just trying to get a picture of that. <laughs> it remains to be seen. We're trying to take an operator neutral approach. We're really trying to look at this as a network and not think about, okay, what's bar, what's capital quarter. I mean, to a certain extent, we need to do that. But what most folks may not know is that by 2035, we may not have the diesel powered locomotives that you see on the tracks today. We will likely be running some greener technology, much higher performing equipment. And so even just riding what we call regional rail is going to feel really different. So it is a challenge to imagine what that network would be like in the future because it's easy to get caught up in what we've got today. And the reality is it's going to be quite different. How much would all this cost? And how's, how's it going to get paid for? That's the billion dollar question. <laughs> well, literally, I think, right? Uh, many billions. Yes, it will likely be in the billions. We don't have a number uh, just because we're still trying to figure out what should be included in it. In a year's time or so, we'll have a pretty high, a high level estimate of what the program might cost in terms of how we're going to pay for it. Like most transportation projects in this country, we're going to have to put together a lot of different funding sources to pay for this program. Um, and I think what's important to note is that working together with our state, with our other rail partners, like there's a lot of other programs and plans going on and we're not here to compete with those programs. We, in fact, we wanna to work together. We wanna to make the entire system better by working together. So I'm hoping that, that through these partnerships, we can be more competitive for funding because we are truly building out a system that is going to serve the mega region for many, many generations. I can imagine, yeah, the state certainly gets involved in something like this because you're talking about a significant fraction of the state. And this is the sort of a project that might ultimately, uh, caucuses in Congress could create around this because it, again, it's large. It would cover a lot of different congressional districts. Okay, Union Pacific Railroad owns the tracks right now that the corridor uses. Are they on board with this? We will have to work closely with them, absolutely. We haven't presented a plan to them yet because we don't have one. Um, and frankly, it would be unproductive to show them plans that weren't fully baked. <laughs> um, but we absolutely are going to be working with them when we have more developed ideas. They're definitely an important partner in this. Well, and there's a precedent, I think, too, isn't there? Because the corridor is 30 years old. and if I recall correctly, when it started, well, it was a different railroad then, Southern Pacific owned it, but the founding authorities worked out, the state worked out a deal with Southern Pacific to pay to improve certain parts of the line in exchange for a commitment to run a certain number of uh, capital corridor trains. I would imagine a deal along those lines would be, I don't want to predict anything, but I imagine that's probably where everybody would look, right? Something similar. If you want more capacity, pay more mm -hmm. money, build certain things, uh, particularly if you want that to be a faster line, you'd probably have to do things again with electrification or maybe with, you know, you think of the Martinez Bridge built in the 1930s, right? It's uh, occasionally it stops for ship traffic. That's not gonna be compatible, I think, with the vision that you're talking about. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna have to work with UP. I would like to see our negotiations with the UP be coordinated through the state because really if we're looking at the network it's not effective it's not efficient to go to the, sit down with the UP and talk about singular projects all over the region it really makes more sense to have a discussion about the network and I think that would be beneficial to the UP as well well and that's an interesting point I mean uh, Union Pacific it's it's a big railroad. It's all over the West, West of Chicago. Mm -hmm. 
uh, certainly all over California. And there are other rail projects in other parts of the state that would also involve Union Pacific and different agencies doing their own version of something like this, I suppose. One thing that struck me, I listened to the presentation the other day, and it was this idea that looking at New York and in Chicago and in Washington, the amount of distance you can travel in an hour on a train, well, it was 35 miles out of San Francisco. And, and that's because of really the Bay Crossing and such things like that. From New York, you can cover 80. In Chicago, 55. In Washington, 85. And I thought that sort of illustrates your point, doesn't it? That mm -hmm. Rail travel in this state, because of geography, perhaps for other reasons, is slower than, and, and the idea is to get those kinds of speeds, or not, well, it is speed, but I mean that, that sort of reach, right? That when all is yes. said and done, we might be able to go 80 miles in an hour here, as opposed to 35. That's exactly right. Those other mega regions you mentioned, because their reach by rail within an hour is much further, there are more choices, more options for people who need to get around the mega region. And I know we're mostly talking about passenger rail, but you know, the, this goods movement is just as important. Trucks use our roads as well. And we have a, a tremendous traffic congestion problem in our mega region as, as, as people are aware. So the more that we can shift to other modes, be rail or bus or ferry, the more we can relieve the congestion on our highways. So it does behoove us to work on the entire transportation system and have different options, which are suitable for different types of trips. Uh, the great thing about rail is that you're not sharing the road, right? As long as you have that that capacity to run more trains, as you mentioned, um, you can carry a lot of people and you're not going to be subject to traffic congestion. That's where we are working on reliability issues. So there's, there's a lot of different variables in the equation. <laughs> you know, equity has also come up as a, uh, one of the goals of this project to build this out uh, with equity in mind. How does that play out specifically? I mean, transportation really is supposed to serve the entire region. Uh, mm -hmm. What does equity mean in this case? How does that affect your planning? Well, equity is an extremely important component of our planning. What it means is that we're going to be working directly with community-based organizations, communities that have been historically marginalized or left out of the conversation or, or impacted uh, negatively by transportation projects. In, in our history, oftentimes transportation projects did hurt communities of color or low-income communities. So we want to make sure that from the start, we have an approach that is inclusive and that listens to the concerns of different communities. And the way it plays out in the program, I think is um, one, you know, we'll be looking at where are, where are the improvements that we're proposing? How does that benefit or impact the communities they go through? And secondly, when the service is running, are we in fact, providing increasing opportunities for people to access more jobs to help them, to benefit them, to increase their housing and job opportunities. And you mentioned earlier the concept of 24-hour service. I think that having service available, not just during the commute periods, but during most hours of the day is an incredible equity opportunity, because there are a lot of jobs are out there that are not eight to five jobs. And if the train doesn't run during those hours for you to access those jobs, well, then your choices are much limited. And you might have to drive if you have a car, or you might have to take a bus, but that might entail 
multiple transfers and, and a long trip, depending on how far you're going. So I think the extended hours that we would like to make possible through our program is a huge equity benefit. I had one other question here that's kind of a local one. Uh, another thought I've heard about this is that uh, as this project develops, uh, there may be side projects that it inspires along the way. Of course, you're familiar with Davis likely. We have a track from Davis that goes north to Woodland, ultimately up to Dunnigan and, and places north from there. Has there been any discussion ever about bringing that part into the project? I mean, Woodland and Davis are almost twin cities at this point. I'm sure someone would disagree with me on that, but the point is uh, there's, there's a lot in common. If someone wants to build a city from scratch, there's land north of there where you could, I'm not advocating it, but there's room if someone wanted to do that. Does that ever come up, this idea of using like that line from Davis North? Has that ever been mentioned in a idea along the way? Um, I haven't heard of it yet, but that doesn't mean that um, it can't be explored. I mean, I think our priority is to make sure that the existing system works well. BART is under, uh, has been under pressure in the past to extend lines and go, you know, have different branches going to different parts of the district. Um, and they have a system expansion policy, but it's tough on the system. If, if your core system doesn't have what it needs to maintain uh, reasonable travel time, reasonable reliability and the frequencies, adding more lines or stations may compound the problem. So first we just need to make sure we improve the, the, the guts of our system and make sure that works well. As, as they say, that could be mission creep if you started going out to other areas. I suppose. <laughs> yes. So uh, we're at the end. Uh, what was the website again? Link21program.org. Link, so people can go there and keep up on what's going on here. And I imagine this will be a story for years to come. So we have yes. been talking with Camille Tsao. She is the Capital Quarter Project Manager for Link21 uh, about that project. Camille, thank you very much for appearing on Davisville today. Thank you much, very much for having me. Uh, I am Bill Buchanan. This is Davis Phil on KDRT. Thank you all for listening.